from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program, featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the Friday night edition of the program. If you want to join our late night national town hall conversation, give us a call, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And a couple of things that are going on today, not the busiest news day since it was such an exciting week in, uh, in Headlineville, but... Uh, Biden administration regulators are now setting their sights on the credit card industry. We'll jump into that a little bit later uh, as if they didn't have anybody else they could beat up. Um, you know, they're beating up the American people daily with the disaster at the border. And um, you've got the governor of Maryland has now put a DEI consultant on the state's port commission. Uh, and some are indicating that it's because they put somebody there because of their race instead of their merit, that this is why this um, disaster happened with the bridge. I don't know if that's true or not, but we'll uh, we'll look into that a little bit later. And let's see. Uh, Trump blasted uh, Biden as a rocket scientist for skipping the um, wake of the murdered NYPD officer. And I got to say, yeah, I agree. This was probably the, one of the dumbest things you could do. Uh, it took Ted Cruz, I don't know, three, four years right before New Yorkers uh, weren't looking for him when he said something even remotely, uh, um, you know, um, critical of of New York. And uh, this is a lot worse than a political statement from somebody. This is insulting to be in New York fundraising while, you know, one former president's going to the wake and the other three are like, ah, we're good. We're going to hang out with Lizzo, who went on a tirade afterwards saying that she doesn't like how people treat her and talk about her, about her weight and this and that. And that's not what she signed up for when she signed up for showbiz. Go figure. Unbelievable. So those are some of the things that are going on. Another thing that's happening is the uh, protests. There are protesters everywhere. Now, outside of the Biden fundraiser, the, um, the pro Hamas um, protesters, they didn't miss an opportunity to go and try to shame Barack Obama and Joe Biden and the rest of them for not being full throated supporters of Hamas. So they were out there protesting and there was lots and they were cursing and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And one uh, pro Hamas protester um, was inside Biden's fundraiser yesterday and he yelled at him and saying, you have blood on your hands, yelling at him. And then another, Suzanne DeWitt, she is a 89-year-old Holocaust survivor. She was speaking in California at the Berkeley City Council meeting, and she was shouted down by another pro-Hamas protester that wouldn't even allow this, this sweet old woman that survived an atrocity to speak. Listen to this. Led to the murder of 1,200 Israelis and the brutal torture and rape of, of uh, women, the destruction Lies! of property. Lies! Lies! Ladies and gentlemen, now you can hear they're banging the gavel, they're going at it, uh, yelling one atrocity does not uh, justify the other. One genocide does not justify another. And again, she was saying that this led to the murder of 1,200 Israelis and the brutal torture and rape of women. And they and they just yelled, lies, lies, stop your lies, as if that never happened. And it's this uh, broken part of reality that people are, are just stuck on, right? It's like, no, 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 it's okay if you kill the Jews, but you can't come back and kill the other people. Because they say, no, 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 because it seems like nobody from Hamas actually gets killed. It's only innocent women and children that get killed when the IDF strikes back. At least that's the narrative that you'd be told. Now, I'm not trying to trivialize in any way that collateral damage isn't a real thing and that somehow we should accept the fact that innocent people die in war. No, I don't think it's a good thing. I don't think any of us should accept it as a good thing. I think we can accept it as a fact. 
but we don't have to accept it as a good thing. But it is a reality. And I don't think anybody wants it. Now, they're trying to, each side is painting the other side as this ruthless genocidal regime. But the reality is we saw what happened. And they try to hide behind, and they, meaning Hamas, tries to hide behind this idea that uh, because they've treated us so badly for so long, we couldn't help it. We had to go there and slit the baby's throats. We had to go there and set them on fire. No, I'm sorry. (laughs) This isn't the Middle Ages anymore. I think we uh, have more sophisticated ways of dealing with people. But that's exactly what happened. And somebody who's been really vocal on this is the CEO of Convention of States, Mark Meckler. And he's been out there blasting the Biden administration for how they've been treating Israel. It's a betrayal, especially what happened at the U.N. Security Council. Mark Meckler, welcome back. Uh, Good to be with you, Rich. Thanks for having me. So what's your take on what's going on here with the Biden administration and and all of this uh, pressure from Hamas? Look, I think the Biden administration is pandering to its far left base. I think the smarter people in the administration understand they're saying sometimes at the surface the right things about Israel, especially in the beginning when Israel started to respond. But at this point, what they're doing is they have a, literally abandoned Israel. Uh, I heard today a military official saying they're slow walking some of the deliveries of military aid to Israel. And heinously this week, you had the U.S. opt out. They, they could have stopped a resolution against Israel calling for a ceasefire, and instead the U.S. abstained from that. By the way, that resolution criticizing Israel, calling for a ceasefire, led by China and Russia and cheered by Iran. And I would just say, Rich, pretty much a litmus test led by China and Russia, cheered by Iran. You know it's a bad thing. Hell yeah. That's, it's, it's a horrible idea. It's a disaster to think that this is how they do it. Uh, but this is it seems to be these are the people that Biden wants to impress. Now, wh- how do you see this thing unfolding, Mark Meckler? Because we're in, we're in pretty bad shape. And I think Biden's come in and he's set fire to to Europe. He's set fire to the Middle East. He's been so weak that China's, a, you know, continuing to make their threats, although they've always made those threats uh, on Taiwan. But it seems like the world is so much in so much more of a precarious place now than it was before. How do we end up? Yeah, look, I think that's entirely accurate. And starting with the Middle East, I would say that regardless of what the United States does, and they've stated this openly, Israel's going to do what they have to do. And what that means is they're going into Rafa and they're going to end Hamas. They are going to de- completely destroy and dismantle Hamas. There's going to be some sort of Israeli presence in Rafa. It's going to be into the, not just Gaza, but it's going to be in the West Bank. I think ultimately it could lead to a conflict with Hezbollah. Uh, that's in northern Israel. I mean, this is a conflagration, and it's one that has to take place. Literally, the United States has prevented this from happening for many years, but Israel is going to have to deal with its enemies. Around the globe, my fear is that the United States has been weakened dramatically, and it's not just by Joe Biden. This has been going on for a long time. This really started under President Obama, who removed a lot of our war, war fighting capability. It's going on again in the Biden administration, which is just Obama 2.0. And they are leaning towards Iran. They are abandoning our allies around the world. They're empowering our enemies. And I think we slide closer and closer, precipitously so, to World War III. If we don't show strength in the world, then the world falls apart. There is a vacuum out there when the United States doesn't exhibit power. And right now we're not exhibiting power. It's a it's a real it's a real shame to see where the United States has come, Mark Meckler, and whether it's on the international front or on the domestic front, like uh, we typically talk to you about, about the Convention of States. And uh, before we uh, wrap up, I want you to let everybody know how they can find out more about Convention of States. Sure. If you think the federal government's out of control and, of course, Rich, all your listeners do, there's only one way to get it back into control, and that is to call a Convention of States and impose amendments to the United States Constitution that limit the scope, power, and jurisdiction of the federal government, impose term limits, impose a balanced budget amendment, do away things like the Department of Energy, the EPA, and the Department of Education. If folks find that appealing, they can go to conventionofstates.com, or they can follow me at Mark Meckler on X. Outstanding, sir. You are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. I want to wish you and your family a very blessed Easter, and thanks for staying up late with us, Mark. God bless you too, Rich. You bet. All right, folks, we're coming right back. We continue our conversation. Uh, Of course, your calls are welcome on if they're on topic. If not, 
Hang on till open phone America. 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. commentary in your analysis than there is on a news network. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, welcome back, familia. We continue our conversation. And as many of you know, it is Good Friday. This is the Friday that is marked by uh, the Christian faith, right, as uh, the Friday, days before the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. And it's a a solemn and holy day. And of course, these days are not exactly accurate per se. They're symbolic. And they were chosen by the church, the early church. And, you know, some people try to, I guess, undercut them by saying, well, these are once pagan holidays. And yes, they sure were. But today they are solemn and holy holidays that reflect solemn and holy things. And as we reflect on the um, the life and the legacy uh, of Jesus the Christ and his ministry on earth, the 33 years where he lived and worked and walked this planet, we, um, we look at that and we, we, we don't want to take that in vain, but we want to take the lessons that we've learned both in, in the Gospels and in the rest of the Scriptures and the book of Revelation and all of the prophecies and, and apply that to today. <clears throat> so that we're all the much wiser. And to do that, you don't get a, le- a lesson on theology or spirituality or faith from me. Uh, that would be in vain. Um, I'm, uh, I struggle, right, to, to put it mildly. But Pastor Paul Begley, he's co-pastor of Freedom Fellowship uh, Church in Wildwood, Florida. He's host of The Coming Apocalypse, excuse me, the co-author of Revelation 911, How the Book of Revelation Intersects with Today's Headlines, and he is our guest right now, and he's going to break it all down for us. Pastor Paul, welcome, sir. Thank you so much, Rich. Great to be on the broadcast. You bet. Thank you, and uh, good Friday to you. Now, let's, um, let's chat a little bit about uh, Good Friday, and then we'll work into a little bit about the work that you're doing, and then um, maybe we'll end up in the third segment talking about this Black Swan event that people are warning about uh, that may be coming. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, the um, the meaning of Good Friday from your perspective. Well, you know, Good Friday, of course, is uh, the recognition of Jesus' life, his ministry, uh, the fact that uh, of course, he was also a political threat to the Sanhedrin uh, and to the leaders of the Jewish uh, synagogue. And so, and, and the reason he was a threat, he wasn't trying to be. But when he went around healing the sick and opening the eyes of the blind, and, and his message of that there is hope and redemption, and that not necessarily all the traditions of the of the establishment. Um, you know, that didn't go over real well to the guys that were running the show. But at the end of the day, Jesus was Jewish. He came from the tribe of Judah. He he never broke the law one time, uh, although he may have been accused of it. And, uh, and of course, as the Son of God, his main mission was to come give his life on the cross, to, to break the curse of sin, and to give every one of us an opportunity to be redeemed and to be set free and to have that, uh, you know, that joy of salvation through Christ. Well, amen to that. Now, Pastor Paul, so many, uh, you know, believers, uh, Christians believe that, you know, today is the day that Jesus was crucified and and, uh, gave his life on the cross for the sinful nature of man. And as we uh, anticipate the resurrection in a few days, which uh, made every everyone whole and gave us all an opportunity to um, experience the fullness of of what Jesus has uh, for each and every one of us, there's also a lot of 
difficult times that we face now. You know, I'm not talking about the tribulation, but the tribulations of, of life in general. And there's so many of right. them. And something that uh, I think um, you, you talk about often, uh, both in the book, uh, uh, Revelation 911, how the Revela- the book of Revelation intersects with today's headlines and uh, on the coming apocalypse is is how some of that is materializing today. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's quite remarkable, really. You can't, it's, it's just, uh, when you start to look at the, all the current events that are taking place, whether it be the war in Ukraine, in Europe, the threat of potentially NATO, feels from Russia, and Russia feels from NATO. The Middle East situation, the attack on Israel by Hamas, uh, and then now the war that's raging in Gaza, and the, and, and the United Nations turning against Israel because of how they're uh, orchestrating the war. That's right. actually prophecy. It says in the book of Zechariah um, that the whole world would come against Israel at, some, at a certain point. We didn't know why when I've read those scriptures, but now we start to see why, because people are, uh, you know, the very, you know, you got 30,000 people dead, you know, folks are feeling like that's enough, it's enough. But at the same time, Israel's saying, you got to understand, we have dealt with these folks forever, and they came into our nation, they they slaughtered our people, uh, we're going to put an end to it by, com- by finishing off the Hamas itself. So... Yeah, we've got that going on. We've got the high inflation, Rich, here in America. We've got mm-hmm. the southern border wide open. We don't know how many terrorists are getting planted in our country. Uh, I even wonder, you know, what really did happen with the ship in Baltimore. We can talk about that later. But there's sure. so many things that are happening right now that the Bible said would happen. Wars, rumors of wars, and apocalyptic signs in the heavens simultaneously, like the solar eclipse and the blood moons. And, and these always seem to happen during times of great turmoil on earth. And so the Bible said that's exactly how it would play out just before the return of the co- second coming of Christ. Doesn't mean Christ comes the next day, but it does right. mean we've entered into a um, an apocalyptic era is what I like to call it. Uh, we're in a final season, which could be what, 50 years, 100 years, uh, 50 months? Nobody right. knows, but we're all watching and praying, and we should be preparing for the times that, that's taking place. Yeah, well put. Uh, Pastor Paul Begley is co-pastor of Freedom Fellowship Church in Wildwood, Florida. Yeah, he's the host of the coming apocalypse and co-author of Revelation nine one one. How the Book of Revelation intersects with today's headlines, and uh, I think we're seeing quite a bit of that. And we're going to continue our conversation with him. Uh, straight ahead. Now, Pastor Paul, we've got about 30 seconds before uh, the music kicks in, but what um, what would you say is the most um, striking nuance that you see this Good Friday compared with the Good Fridays of past? Uh, you know, it's the, the, t- the tension, the anger, the hopelessness uh, among people in America. They feel their government has forsaken them, and they're wondering, is there redemption? Is there hope right. for them? Is there redemption? Is there hope? Well, we're coming right back with Pastor Paul Begley to discuss redemption, hope, and everything else. Folks, don't go anywhere. It's Rich Valdez, Pastor Paul Begley. We're coming right back. 833-482-5337 is the phone number if you want to join us. Don't go anywhere. Thank you, Rich, and thank you for everything. I know you very well, and I have I listen, but I have a lot of people that listen, and they love your show, and I appreciate it very much. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. We continue our conversation on Good Friday with Pastor Paul Begley, uh, co-pastor of Freedom Fellowship Church, Wildwood, Florida. He's host of The Coming Apocalypse, and he's co-author of Revelation 911, How the Book of Revelation Intersects with Today's Headlines. And Pastor Paul, I'd like you to 
Uh, we left off with you were talking about the the hope and redemption that exists for humanity today, and uh, I want you to tie that in to what people are seeing. Right, people are opening their eyes and they're seeing one thing, and uh, you know the gospel is a message of of hope and and redemption. And I think people are having trouble reconciling the two. Uh, exactly, Rich. I mean, a couple things have happened. Uh, our nation <clears throat> has. Uh, become very vulnerable. It seems like uh, the culture, the shift in the culture, the shift in the curriculums in the school, the decline of church attendance, um, <clears throat> the lack of faith. Uh, people don't trust each other. You know, I grew up in small town Indiana. Nobody locked their door, okay? We had a party line. There were six houses on one phone line, okay? Now, you don't, nobody don't know their neighbor. They're afraid to know who's next door. They, you know, they're not sure who they can trust. And and so we become a, a different nation, a different culture and the family, the breakdown of the family. And so in our book, revelation nine 11, we not only take on the current events, you know, the, the socioeconomic struggles and the div- divisiveness in America, but we take on the fact that our families have been broke down. Uh, our schools, our test scores are getting lower and lower. Uh, how can it be that an, the greatest nation in the world uh, ranks so low in academics? Um, there's, there's so many things that is really concerning people. And that's why they start feeling hopeless. And they see politicians go in and go out and they fight among each other in their own parties and nothing gets passed. And, and, you know, it becomes a, a moment where, where do we turn? And that's where, with, it, with our book, Revelation 9-11, we talk about all these current events. We tie it to the book of Revelation, even, and to Jesus' teachings in the Gospels. And then we say, you know what? That's why you don't put your faith in man, but you put your faith in God. You have to. It's no one political party, no one politician is going to redeem us or save us or help us pull ourselves up. And I really believe this, Rich. This Mm -hmm. solar eclipse, which is going to go through seven cities of Nineveh, this is our Nineveh moment. America, Billy Graham said it one time, he said, there's a day coming that America is going to have their Nineveh moment when they need to repent, just like they did in the days of Jonah. And I think this solar eclipse is a sign from God, just like he uses solar eclipses and blood moons and comets and different signs. This is America's Nineveh moment. Time to repent. Time to get. We need some adults in the room. We need. We need to let's turn this thing around. And Christ is the answer. And that's why Jesus came into this world uh, to redeem mankind, not just to redeem us everyone individually. That's true, but also to help the culture change. And we can do it if we look to Him. Uh, I, I agree with that. I think Jesus was quite the culture warrior in his day, and uh, we could we could use that today. Uh, you mentioned something moments ago, right? Uh, the uh, the change of the curriculum in the schools, Pastor. This is something that I think whether you're an atheist, a Christian, agnostic, whatever you want to label yourself as, this should alarm you. Um, from your perspective, as as the head of a church. Um, how, do you see this getting better? Do you see us gaining some traction to kind of uh, slow down the culture war here? Or do you think it's out of control? No, I do see some improvements in some of the states. Uh, you do see legislators in some of the states uh, setting, you know, what happened to us? COVID did one good thing for us. It, it made all the kids stay home and the parents had to look to see what they were learning. And when the parents saw the curriculum, they couldn't believe their eyes. They couldn't believe what they heard. And they've stormed the, the school and, and have taken over many of the school boards. And, there's, and that's fixing the curriculum because you've got parents. It doesn't matter what their uh, belief system is. They know that you, they don't want pornographic material being used on five you know, kindergarten kids. They don't want certain things. They don't want critical race theory taught because it's a lie. They don't want certain uh, Marxism. And tell, teaching kids that be, communism and super socialism is better than capitalism and freedom. So that's one of the things. I do see that happening. That's going to take time, but, but it's still going to be a battle. 
But when we took prayer out of school, Rich, when we removed the Bible mm. and the Ten Commandments, can we not see how far we have fallen without the Word of God and the establishment of that? Because the nation was founded on Judeo-Christian values. So there is a little bit of a revival going on. There is a pushback um, to restore some of this. And I, my prayer uh, is to continue to show people, and I, and I do. I talk about it in my book, Revelation 9-11. I really do. So there is great hope. There is movement. But we got a long way to go. And uh, there's a lot of secret societies out there. There's some people working in some uh, different forums, like the World Economic Forum and the United Nations mm. and some of these others that are fighting this very thing I'm saying tonight. They hate the truth. They hate what's good. Many of them, they believe they're, they're power hungry. They want to have uh, two types of people, the ruling class and the rest of us. Yeah. And we have to keep reminding them that we've got the numbers. We got the righteousness and we've got the faith. And so pastors, if you're out there listening, many great pastors we have, Rich, but boy, we got to step Thank it up God. several notches. This, this, this is our fault. We let a lot of this slide, and we didn't stand up and tell the people what was going on. So, there's well, hope. Pastor, that, that it's it's admirable for you to say that because I think that there's a, oftentimes that's been a critique I've had, and not of you or you know any pastor right. I know personally, but in general, I think the church. Um, has abdicated a lot of its authority, and maybe because of uh, the government's involvement. But I know when I was a kid, um, there was still a massive um, state-run foster system, but there were still orphanages that were church-run when yep. I was a kid. I don't think those exist at all today. I, I don't think there's no, a church that I that you can go and bring your kid to if you're in crisis. It just there might be a crisis pregnancy center, but there's no church, right? And that used to be a thing, Pastor. You're exactly right, and and here's what's happened. We've let, we've allowed the state to now raise our kids, mm -hmm. and then the the ones who don't have parents, they fall through the cracks. And actually, we're, we're you, as you know, there's they're uncovering now that some of this um, some of this abuse. What I mean by abuse is kids who get taken out of the home, go into a foster system, and then disappear. This right. is happening, Rich. And so the church, I, I will say again, the church has to step up and say, it's our responsibility to take care of the widows. It's our responsibility to look after the children. And if there's a wolf in, if there's a wolf, I don't care if he's a politician, a judge, or the neighbor next door, if he's a wolf, call a wolf out and protect the sheep. And that's the church's job. And I think some of our pastors, some of our clergy, including myself, we've set back and allowed the inmates to run the asylum, okay? <laughs> and it's time for us to become the men and women that God has called us to be. And we can do that with integrity, with class, with love and compassion. And use the, you know, Jesus said, I give you the power. Behold, I give you power to tread over those serpents and scorpions. So I have hope. And I, and I, and I, that's why I want to say this book, this book tells you all the different things that are happening, but I don't leave it there and say, look at all the terrible things. And yeah, we're in know. bad shape. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. I also say, here's what we got to do to fix it, guys. Here's how we can work together. And, and also if you're out there and you don't know Christ as your savior and you're hurting, there is hope for you. And we help break that down with, with the love as the, as the book begins to flow. So uh, it, it can change your life. And, and we're already hearing from people since it's uh, been released. It's, it's changing lives. Folks, the book is Revelation 911, How the Book of Revelation Intersects with Today's Headlines. Uh, the author, Pastor Paul Begley, and we're coming right back with him straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-482-5337. That's Valdez with an S. Well, Mr. Valdez, you have one of the greatest shows that radio has ever had. America at Night. 
with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, welcome back, familia. We continue our discussion uh, with our guest, Pastor Paul Begley, and he's written the book, Revelation 911, how the book of Revelation intersects with today's headlines. And when we look at these headlines, we see stories about, you know, COVID-19, uh, people that are hungry, people that are getting killed in Gaza, people that are getting killed all over the world, um, all sorts of things that are going on, artificial intelligence, um, Biden's recklessness and the looming threat of World War III, uh, inflation that seems to go up and then it goes down and then it goes up again. And you've got the World Economic Forum talking about transhumanism, their war on God. They actually hate God. Uh, the whole woke culture that's out there uh, promoting that men can be women, women can be men, and they're targeting our children with this. And if you don't like it, they'll cancel you, right? You got cancel culture. And it just goes on and on, not to mention the mass shootings. And many people think this is the end of the world. These are the end times. Um, uh, as Pastor Paul pointed out, these are probably just the precursors to the end times. But you've written the book about it, and you've laid out the problems, but you've also laid out the solutions for when this potential black swan scenario happens. So tell us about it. Yeah, the black, you know, when we may have already begun to see the black swan process. When the, when the ship crashed into the bridge there in Baltimore, this has crippled the ability to get fertilizer to the farmers in the heartland of America. And not just that. But a lot of the supply chain for the food distribution, a lot of it is now stalled. And that bridge was used to haul all the toxic chemicals, you know, flammable stuff, uh, the, you know, things that you don't want having uh, major hazmat problems in downtown Baltimore. So they ran it all through that bridge. Now, what, what people don't know is four hours before the bridge was hit, the largest fertilizer plant in America in in Florida exploded and just completely just burned and and so wow. all of a sudden we're getting ready to start the planting season and I'm I was raised you know in the heartland of a, I'm from the cornfields of Indiana and now here we are it's time to plant and there's no fertilizer there's no nutrients they can't get it to them you have two big hits in a four hour period and I still want to say who was that, that ship looked like it was hacked. That, that ship turned directly toward the pylon. It gunned it. The smoke went roaring. Even the guys that were the pilots were screaming, we're not in control of the ship. I don't have control of the ship. I, I think we may have had a terrorism attack, and I think this is just the start of the Black Swan uh, process. I don't think it just one hit. It's going to be several, and it's going to be in different infrastructures. And so we warn people in our book about this. And it's because, this is why the southern border was so important, that we just do things correctly. You know, we want, we want people to come to America. It's the land of the free and the home of the brave. And it's, it's the greatest nation in the world. But we can't have uh, just wide open and, and the enemies who hate America. So, yeah, the, the Black Swan event, I believe, is a critical economic uh, strike against America. I believe it's begun, and there are more to come. And this, and God knew it was coming, and so He's sent us a solar eclipse. He's saying, "Let me talk to you. Let me show you something. There's areas you got to fix. You're vulnerable." And I believe we're in that time. Pastor Paul Begley, a lot. That's a lot for people to deal with. Where do they find hope? Where do they find redemption? Well, hope is always in the cross. Uh, this this holy weekend, really, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. And if the more people who f go back to the basics, go back to the to the roots, and go back to finding their relationship with God, the stronger we will be as a nation. Because the more people whose integrity has been established, uh, the stronger the country gets. And so we have to start there. And Jesus has never left us. He's never failed us. He's still with us if we'll call on him, if we'll allow him to be the Lord of our lives. And so, uh, you know, Revelation 9-11, we, we really want to show everybody, you, you know, you mentioned the, 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 all these cultural changes and wars and rumors of wars and, and AI. And, and, and there's also the UFO deal. I mean, I think Ronald Reagan said it. 
He yeah. said, you know, what's it going to take to bring peace to the earth that we have to have an alien invasion? That was 1987, giving a speech in the United Nations right on the podium. And in a way, we may be seeing that type of scenario. Being, I'm not saying that the aliens are invading. What I am saying is the concept of that maybe we could be vulnerable to an alien force. Maybe that's the only thing that will unite us. We don't seem to want to unite as people here on the planet. But Jesus is the way that we get united, really. If we would turn to him and start loving our neighbor like we love ourselves and start doing the things God asks us to do, it's not very hard. Things can change quickly. And so that's the hope. We bring that mm -hmm. message all the way home and rich. I mean, shows like yours, so important. The media plays a huge role. Oh, right. my Lord, you guys play a huge role, you know, uh, in sharing the truth with folks and stimulating thought and causing folks to reconsider where do you stand with God right now in your life. Amen to that. Well, Pastor, I want you to let everybody know as quickly as you can how they can get a copy of the book and how they could get uh, a little bit of that hope. Absolutely. You can get our book anywhere books are sold, really. It's, it went number one. Uh, uh, six times it's went number one. It's only been released four days. It nice. started going number one four months before it shipped. Uh, Amazon.com, it went number one. You can go to Barnes & Noble, you know, Books A Million, Walmart, Target. Um, just go online and just order it. And I, here's what I've been telling my folks. Order five of them, and here's why. You get this book and you start reading it, you can't lay it down. And then you'll want to give it to somebody to read, and you'll never get it back, okay? <laughs> so order, order five, one's yours, give the other four to people you think it might, might really help them. And watch and see, uh, they'll thank you for the gift you just gave them. So uh, anywhere the books are sold, go to Amazon.com um, and, and order tonight. All right. Pastor, you, you outdid me. I usually tell people, buy two, one for yourself, one to give away. But I, I like your philosophy. <laughs> buy five. Yeah, buy five. <laughs> Pastor, right. I, you are a, a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, have a, a blessed Good Friday and Happy Easter. You too, Rich. It was a pleasure to be on the show tonight. You bet. Godspeed. All right, folks, we continue uh, with your calls and more straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. With Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. We go to the phones. Let's go to, let's see, where do we go? Brian, Washington, Connecticut, WLAD. Brian, go right ahead. You're on with Rich Valdez. Yes. Um, as I was a child, the Lord Jesus came to me and spoke to me and said, I am Jesus. Uh, he said that about three times because I at first thought, you know, no, I'm not Jesus, because I was just a child. No, I'm not Jesus. And then the Lord said, I am Jesus. And I realized, and I felt this oh, special you're feeling. you're Jesus, not me. Right, you got it. Finally. Yeah, I felt this special feeling. And then when I was 18 years old, my first meditation gathering at Branford, Connecticut, um, it was non-denominational, which where I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my life and in my heart. Yeah. In the five-hour meditation, um, I was taken up in spirit to heaven in the presence of the Lord. Lucky and you. At, Why'd you come yeah, back? And, that, and so I've been sent out and about to talk to all the different Christian churches. I believe they call the that the Great the Commission. I don't mean to cut you off, Brian, but that music means we got to go. Uh, well, Godspeed to you. I'm glad you had such a divine experience, uh, one I wish I'd had. And if honestly, if you send me to heaven, I don't think I'm coming back. Folks, it's Good Friday. We continue our conversation here. Big shout out to everybody in Connecticut and everywhere else. Don't go anywhere. It's Good Friday, and we're coming right back. Live from the city that never sleeps. 
17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program, featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the Friday night edition of the program. It's Good Friday, and if you want to give us a call, feel free, 833-4825-337-8334, Valdez. And, of course, there's a ton of news out there this week. Not so much today. Today's been a pretty slow news day. You know, when they start taking pot shots at all the um, the big political people, you know that it's basically a slow news day and they're just doing what they do. But the reality is we there was a lot of stories this week with the um, ship that crashed into the bridge uh, with the cop that was murdered in New York City and so many other things that occurred this week. And so many people, you know, have an outlook that feels bleak to many. It, it's um, it's difficult. People don't know where they're going, where, where, how things are going to work out. And there's a, a degree of uncertainty, I think, that goes along with things. And then, of course, there's a, people that are very hopeful, uh, that are very um, hope-filled because it's Easter. It's the resurrection of Jesus, and they're celebrating their faith. And all of that brings us to today, right? Good Friday, and we're looking at Easter weekend here. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk about the, the importance of that for those that um, participate. Super, and for those who don't. Great, you get to learn a little more tonight. And uh, something that our guest has um, said that I find interesting and I really appreciate is the world is not falling apart, it's falling into place. And I think that's important. And he's written a book that is so apropos to this program, America at Night. The book is called Midnight in America. (laughs) That sounds like a radio show if I haven't heard one before. And It's coming out um, the 17th of April, so you can pre-order it now. The author, Pastor Phil Hotzenpeller. Phil, Pastor, welcome. Hey, thank you, Rich. I appreciate it. And by the way, the book is actually coming out April 2nd now. Oh, wonderful. So people can can order it uh, on Amazon or all their other dependable platforms that they use. But I am thrilled to be with you and excited. Uh, We're out here in California, the land of fruit and nuts. Uh, but we moved from New Jersey uh, to oh, wow. come here. How about that one? Look at that. Where in Jersey? We lived in Kenilon, so we were in North Jersey. Yeah, what's that, Route 23? Yeah, it's close to Wayne, some of those places that uh, you probably drive by occasionally. Yeah, yeah, you got bear up there. There is black bear up there for sure. Yeah, we had them <laughs> in our backyard jumping on our trampoline, believe it or not. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, everybody I know up there in Wayne in uh, Upper Passaic County and up that way, everybody's always telling me about the bear, and they, they're just like, we just shoo them away. And I'm thinking, if I saw a bear in Bergen County where I live, where it's nothing like where you live, uh, everybody's house is, you know, quarter-acre parcel if you're lucky, um, you know, I'd freak out if I saw a bear. So uh, <laughs> kudos to you, Pastor. Well, I want to talk about the book. I want to talk about Good Friday. I want to talk about Easter. Um, and, and we have a little bit of time to do it. So let, let's talk about this statement that you've made. The world's not falling apart. It's falling into place. Why, why did you say that? You know, it's really interesting. It, it, the journey of this book really started in 2020 with the, uh, you know, pandemic and, you know, how we're going to approach life. And we made a decision at our church that we weren't going to close our doors. We were going to stay open. Uh, even at risk of, you know, jail time or whatever. And we just said, we just believe, number one, the Constitution. Number two, we believe God is king, and we're going to honor that. And as I Mm -hmm. began to think about it, you know, just there are a lot of things that are falling in place. And sometimes we get, you know, on the negative, pessimistic side of things, and we can't see hope in our generation. And yet I believe every generation has a problem they need to solve whether it was a generation that had to solve slavery or civil rights or whatever it is. And this should be a time when we embrace the day we're in and say, how do we fix things? How do we make things better? Uh, How do we become a better and stronger society and more and more faith in God? And so that's where the statement actually came from. 
All right. Well, I love it. And I, I think it's it's a really good statement because I think, you know, even me, I get caught up in that stuff. I look at the news. I look at what's going on. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is falling apart. <laughs> Everything is just falling apart. And and yeah. I, I like that you put it into perspective because, you know, oftentimes, you know, um, not to get overly spiritual here, but there's so many instances uh, in the Bible, whether it's Jesus particularly saying it or are examples of it from biblical figures uh, where, oh, ye of little faith. It rings so true, mm. right? And I know mm-hmm. that's a reality for me. While I might know the truth, um, there's a bunch of times where I think, "Oh my gosh, this is it. This isn't working. I can't do it." You know, and, and you just uh, you, you don't you don't err on the side of hope. You err on the side of hopelessness, and and it's easy oh. to do. And I think what's hard to do is to mm-hmm. hold on to your faith and hold on to your hope. Um, how, how do you counsel people, or what are you um, you know in the book? How do you recommend people do that? Well, one of the things that makes the Bible unique of all other religious writings is prophecy, that things spoken thousands of years ago can literally be chronicled on your calendar as being fulfilled. And I deal with a lot of uh, prophecies in there. I have one whole chapter called The Prophetic Clock, where I deal with some things that you can actually look at and go, wow, this is really true. This is amazing. Uh, Even now, here we are, and, you know, in Holy Week, we've got, you know, we've got the resurrection, we've got all these things going on uh, that we celebrate, but keep in mind that that was prophesied in 700 AD by Isaiah the prophet, that the, that the suffering servant would come, that his hands would be pierced through. And, and no one was crucifying in 700. That wasn't developed until Philip of Macedon, the mm. father of Alexander the Great, much later. So it wasn't even a thing back then that they used uh, to, you know, to take the life of another human being. And so when I look at things that are happening, for example, the big, I think the prophetic clock began to tick in 1948 when Israel became a nation, because that was what all the prophets were writing toward. And when that happened, it would then open the door for other prophecies to be, be fulfilled. And we can talk about some of those tonight if you want to. Outstanding. We'll take a quick pause right here. Pastor Phil Hotzenpiller. And he is senior pastor of AmericanFaith.com. His new book, Midnight in America, is coming out on Tuesday. And I want to make sure that you get that book. Uh, You can go to Amazon, get one for yourself, one to give away. We're coming right back to discuss Good Friday, the book, and everything else. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Mr. Call Screener, who is a budding radio star, by the way. Richie Valdez is terrific. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, welcome back, familia. We continue our conversation about Good Friday, Easter weekend, and the new book, Midnight in America, by Pastor Phil Hotzenpiller. He's the senior pastor of AmericanFaith.com. And I want to talk about the book. I know you talk about the uh, the story of Samson and how he lost his power. And in the same way you're saying the American church has found itself in a similar position where it's lost its power. Tell us more, Pastor. You know, I was doing a a uh, interview for Epoch Times, I think it was 2020 or 21, and they asked me what I thought the parallels were between the church in China, the church in America, and I said, well, you have the underground church in China, and you have the state church in America, you have the conforming church to what the government's saying, and you have the believing church. Mm -hmm. And so really, we we find ourselves, when you speak of the church, it's almost like you don't have a unified word anymore across America, because you have people that are supporting things that are not even in the Word of God. They're defending, you know, uh, let's call it anti-Constitution things, anti-biblical things. And the interesting thing, I, the question I get asked the most, Rich, is where is America in biblical prophecy? Right. Obviously, we're Americans. We live here. We want to know. And if you ever do a search on it, you're going to find out, number one, nobody knows, or number two, they're going to come up with a very obscure verse in Ezekiel 38, 13, and try to point you in that direction. What I did, I took a fresh set of eyes, and I believe I have a very fresh and original idea 
um, that is biblical and fits into the narrative of the Word of God. And so it's it's a it's a great chapter. It really will open people's eyes up. I don't want to give it all away. Uh, I can give a little bit of it away if you want me to, Rich. But but uh, I want people to get the book, read it, and find out uh, where America is in biblical uh, prophecy. Hmm. So you want me to lay it out? Please do. I'm I'm, okay. I'm I'm waiting to hear it. Okay, so think about this. There there are three states that are very unique in the world. One is Washington D.C. It's actually not a state, but it's a district. But mm-hmm. you have another one called Vatican, and you have a third one called London Incorporated. Huh. All three of those have a lot in common. Now, London Incorporated is only a one square mile area, but it is said to be the financial um, center of the world. Vatican is said to be the religious center of the world, and Washington is really the military center of the world. Of all the other things that are there, the fascinating thing is that the D.C. flag has three stars on it. All three of them have an Egyptian obelisk, which is, if you want to know what one looks like, look at the Washington Monument. That is right, actually yeah, a replica shape, the obelisk, yeah. uh-huh, of the sun god. But you have one that was moved uh, to Rome, uh, from Egypt in the 13th century, uh, and it, sit, it sits right there in the center of Vatican. And then you have a third one that was also moved from Egypt in the 1800s. It's in in uh, London Incorporated. All three of them operate separately from their nations. All three of them have separate laws in many ways. They have their own police force. Uh, they may have even have their own currency, uh, as Vatican does. And so you find some unique things. And what I did was I found those three uh, could be identified in Scripture and especially in the book of Revelation. And so the the, the spoiler alert is not going to happen. I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> but they but I get want you to know, yeah, you got to get the book because it really is. I, I want you to kind of build up to it. And, and understand how things are really falling in place from a biblical, prophetic standpoint. Because this is when, when the Bible really gets exciting, when you say, wow, this was written 700 years ago, or this was written, I mean, 2,700 years ago, or this was written, you know, um, 2,000 years ago. And we're seeing, literally, we can mark our, we can go into history and say, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, Isaiah, or name one of the other prophets. Wow. Really, really interesting stuff, Pastor. Um, I, I, I've never heard you're right. It's an original take. It's a, fr- a fresh look. I had not um, heard this before, and it is really interesting. Definitely piqued my interest. Um, if if people uh, pick up the book and they glean some of that, um, it makes sense to me. But what is the ultimate message that you're hoping that people uh, take from the book and walk away with? I want people to walk away with hope and courage, and I think those are two of the of the strongest character qualities that a human being can have. Because if you if you have courage, then you can face any situation with confidence. If you have hope, then you know there's something beyond the problems that you're dealing with today. And that's really where I go with that. One of the closing chapters is a book called uh, is a chapter called "America Needs More Blacksmiths." Mm-hmm. And one of the strategies of the Philistines in the Old Testament was to take away the blacksmith so they couldn't make weapons of war and they couldn't sharpen their, their tools of agriculture. And today we see how, how First Amendment things are being taken away. Second Amendment is threatened. Constitution is threatened. Free speech is threatened. And you say, like, we need to restore some things because we have all the tools in our toolbox right here in America. We right. need to exercise our rights. We need to stand for those with courage and hope. Hope not only in uh, in the plan of God, the prophetic words of God, but also hope in, in mankind. You know, eventually things kind of get figured out. And if we can, if we don't, if we don't commit national suicide before that moment, I believe that that the American people will rise up with courage and hope and be strong, and and we can rebuild whatever's been lost in the in, in this in this interim time and and restore the values of the republic folks we're on with uh pastor phil hudson pillar he is the author of midnight in america books about to come out make sure you pre-order it now on amazon i always say get one for yourself and one to give away now pastor th- this sounds like an amazing book um wh- why did you pick 
the title Midnight in America? You know, I think lo- I'm living in California, so you know we we were the first shelter in place state. We we've, we've seen a lot of um, just kind of shady things coming out of Sacramento, and I just said, you know what, I'm putting my pulse on on the body called America, and I see the values slipping away. I see what's happening in our schools and and how um, you know everything from you know uh, parent parental rights to you know this this the BLM riots and, and everything that went on is just like chaos was around here. And I said, you know, it feels like it's midnight and, but it's not midnight yet. You know, it's kind of like getting close. It's, it's midnight in America, but, but we just, we're too close to that hour. And, and I just wanted to, to sound a, an alarm from, to do what I could do. The, the same reason I started AmericanFaith.com, I started it basically just to get a word out for, with some good news. I, I had no idea that it would actually work. And now I have a team of 15 and we have wow. about 22 million people on it. And uh, so we, we do about 30 original stories every day and it just is growing exponentially every single day. Um, so, you know, sometimes if you just put your hand to something and try it, uh, God will bless it and he'll honor your hard work and your courage. Amen to that. Now, if people want to learn more about AmericanFaith.com, do they just simply go to the website or is there more that they need to do? Exactly. They can go there and they'll uh, be able to, uh, you know, see stories. Uh, they'll hear podcasts. Uh, uh, I just did an interview with Charlie Kirk. Um, that was good. We've got uh, Laura Trump speaking at our gala for American faith. Um, so that's uh, going to be interesting now that she's a new RNC chairman. And uh, we, we've got I've got Cash Patel on my podcast. I mean, I've got everybody that they want to arrest uh, on my <laughs> podcast. How's that? <laughs> You must be doing something right. Oh, uh, Pastor, uh, I I'm, I'm wish you the best of luck with the book and, and Godspeed in the ministry because, um, you know, literally you're doing the Lord's work and it's an important work that we need in America. Folks, the book is Midnight in America. It's coming out. Make sure you get a copy of it now. Uh, Amazon.com if you want to get a, a copy of that. Or you can check out AmericanFaith.com. That is uh, the website with uh, all this original content on it. Pastor, uh, at the minute and a half we have left, uh, what's your final word of hope for Americans that are listening? You know, I think stay close to your friends and your family. Stay close to your God. You know, look up. You know, as Jesus said, your redemption draws near. You know, don't look down. Just keep looking up, trusting in the Lord, and love people uh, like you want to be loved. And, you know, things will work out for the good. And uh, God is on your side, and He's not going to. Nothing's going to separate you from His love, and His grace, and His mercy. What's Easter looking like at your church this weekend? Well, you know, we we're actually in a service tonight. I slipped out toward the end of it. It was packed out, and uh, you know, a Good Friday service, and tomorrow we're going to have uh, a couple of thousand kids. We're going to give uh, do an Easter egg hunt. We have thirty thousand eggs ready and ready to go out wow. here. And then Sunday morning, we, uh, of course, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's Sunday, so it's, uh, it's Easter. Uh, we'll be packed out. Outstanding. Pastor Phil Hotzenpiller, author of the book Midnight in America and founder of AmericanFaith.com. I want to thank you for being on the show tonight. You're a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. Godspeed to you, sir. Thank you, sir. You bet. All right, folks, we come back with your calls, more, and uh, some additional discussion. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. And we continue our discussions, not so much on Easter and Good Friday, but on a particular topic that I wanted to get into. It's a Friday night, and you know, I like to delve into th- different things. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was brain health and how smartphones could be to blame for the spike in depression and anxiety in particular amongst teenagers. And this is according to an article in The Atlantic suggesting that 
smartphone use in childhood could lead to mental health effects that are negative. And I said, you know what? I want to get to the bottom of that. And we're talking about mental health here. I'm not an expert other than, you know, I, I need mental health. <laughs> so I said, we got to get an expert in here. And tonight we've got Dr. Lee Richardson. Uh, she's, she's been with us before and she's coming back. She is the uh, head of brain health and the coach and consultant at her practice. And she's with us tonight. Dr. Lee, welcome back. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure and a happy good Friday to you. Let's talk about uh, this article because I know that it's, um, you know, there's always been questions about smartphones, screen time, uh, all, all that stuff that say that, you know, they're not good for you in many ways. But I had not heard specifically depression and anxiety in particular amongst teens. Tell us about it. Well, you know, it's interesting because they can clearly correlate the numbers to when the smartphones came out. And there was more than a 50% increase from 2010 to 2019 with the, with depression and anxiety. But more than that, the suicide rate rose 48% for adolescent girls 10 years old, 10 to 19. And for girls 10 to 14, it rose 131%. Those are staggering numbers. Yeah, it's crazy. Now, do you think it's solely smartphones, uh, or is it something in particular that the smartphones offer? Well, I don't think it's solely smartphones. I think that, you know, smartphones offer screen time, and screen time includes social media. Part of that screen time can be video games and dating apps. I mean, it's in all of those we access through our smartphones. Now, Dr. Lee, when you mentioned the um, the ability to access the social media, I think that's a critical component of it. And, and, and that's the reason I'm asking the question, because I feel that there is a, a degree of instant gratification or immediate gratification that kind of goes along with social media where you can, you know, if you want to see an update on somebody's status, you scroll right to it and you get it. If you want to, you know, be entertained, you just open it up and start scrolling and it kind of does its job. But when real life doesn't work the way social media does, I think some people, you know, it, they don't jibe with that. <laughs> and I think that's part of the, the cause of this. Uh, would you agree or disagree with that? Oh, I agree 100 percent. I think that social media has turned us into a comparative society. You know, all we're doing is comparing what our pictures look like to the other pictures that we see online. And you know what happens when you compare? You have a winner and a loser. Yeah, now I know that social media does that, and I think you bring up a good point. But wasn't this always something that has happened, and that's why we have the term keeping up with the Joneses? Haven't people always been kind of competitive with their neighbors? Well, I think they have. But, you know, when you're competitive with your neighbors, the people across the street, it's more of a private thing between you and them. On social media, it's you and, and hundreds and thousands and probably even millions of people that are viewing it. It's just like bullying. You know, bullying's always happened. But it was when it was you and there were maybe two or three other kids that saw it happen, the impact of that was not, it didn't, didn't live on forever. If you catch it on social media, it lives on forever. And it, it plays over and over and over. So I think that the technology, as good as technology is, as much positive as it can bring, it certainly has negative. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Now, with the other aspects of, of um, smartphone use, uh, dating apps and whatnot, what role do you think those play in the, um, the spread of anxiety and depression amongst teenagers? Well, I think that, you know, you either swipe right or swipe left. And if, if nobody acknowledges you, if nobody swipes right on you and you know that, that is that that causes anxiety because that decreases your self confidence. It decreases your self esteem. That starts all that negative chat in your head. Oh, I must not look like. Oh, it must have been what I was wearing. Oh, 
you know, we, we can all find at least 10 things wrong with ourselves, probably within two minutes. And I think that when nobody, and you, you listen to your peers talk, oh my gosh, you know, three people, swipe right on me. And then you're hmm. like, wow, nobody swiped right on me. And how does that make you feel? It makes you feel like a loser. And I guess the same could be said for teenagers who, uh, I guess, seek validation based on the amount of people that comment or like on certain photos or social media posts. Uh, if that's what they're looking for, they may find that or not find that in social media, which could either bolster something that doesn't really exist or kind of highlight something that, that is only perceived to them. Well, and you're so right, because we put something out on social media because we're proud of it, because it means something to us. And we do want that validation. We want somebody to say, wow, that's the coolest thing. Wow. And when we don't get that, that has an impact on our mental health and it has an impact on our physical health. I think one of the biggest things that I, I've seen and heard is it affects people, it affects young people's sleep. And you know, my big my first question is where is your phone sleep? Because if it mm. sleeps right next to you, then you're not you're not getting much sleep. So how do we fix that? And I don't mean just the sleep part, but I mean uh, the fact that people are their mental health is affected by their proudest moments being put on social media and not getting the reaction that they'd like to get. How do you counsel someone that comes in and says, oh, my God, I've been posting about my boyfriend and I, my girlfriend and I, my family and I, uh, whomever. You know, we went on this this trip and we posted some of our vacation photos and nobody liked my photos or nobody said anything encouraging. And now I'm upset. Uh, what do you say to someone like that? Well, I mean, who are you trying to show those photos to? Because your family has probably already seen them and the people that you're closest to probably has. So uh, are you just trying to impress? And I think that that's a big point because we are. The saddest thing to me is the people that develop these rich friendships online, they've never met the person. They have never sat across from the table with a person and laughed or joked or right. even looked them in the eye. And that is that is such a that puts people in such a vulnerable position. Well, for the parents and grandparents that are listening that might have a, a teenaged um, child or, grand, or grandchild that may be going through something like this, what's your best advice uh, for them when it comes to social media and improving mental health? Well, for parents, model the right behavior. Because so many times, every, every behavior is learned. But the good news is, it, what's been learned can be unlearned. But if, if kids come in and they see their, their parents on their phone all the time, looking at social media, that tells them that that's important. That's what you need to be doing. So, you know, I advise every family to have a cutoff time. You don't need to have your phone with you at the end of the day until you go to sleep. Everybody, you know, have a cutoff time, whether it's the kitchen counter whether it's a table in the hall, have a common place where everybody can drop their phone and just leave it until the next morning. And that can be, it sounds fairly easy, but it can be harder because we're so dependent upon our phones. And we all are. And I mean, I have people tell me all the time, well, if that's my alarm clock. I need my phone to wake up. Well, they're still making them, you know? They may, they may seem very ancient, but they're still making it. And it's really just, it's a lifestyle choice. And it's a lifestyle change. And I think that it definitely can be done, but it has mm -hmm. to be done with intent. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and I, I think it's also not just teenagers, uh, but also adults that have a tough time putting the phone down. Honestly, I've seen that happen a lot as well. Folks, we're on with Dr. Lee Richardson, uh, brain health coach and consultant. Uh, check her out at LeeRichardson.com. And when we come back, there's a um, research that shows that religious people are happier than non-believers. How about that on a good Friday? Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-4-VALDEZ. 
That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDES. That's Valdez with an S. Congratulations on this is an amazing show. I know you've worked so hard in the industry, and nobody deserves it more than you do. So I'm happy to see you really succeeding here. It's awesome. America at Night with Rich Valdez. So according to an article in MSN, the uh, debates about the impact of religion in the world have been going on for a long time. There's one facet of that debate, uh, however, which is scientifically um, settled, largely which is from the standpoint of statistics and empirical evidence, how much do we know about whether religious or non-religious people are happier? Well, a lot, it turns out. The literature on health in general and religion is pretty vast. An Oxford University Press book summarizes the research on the subject, uh, saying that it comes in almost 900 pages. And in the analysis of this particular book, it's called The Handbook of Religion and Health, they reviewed 326 articles on the relationship between health and the measures of religiosity and subjective well-being, happiness, or life satisfaction. Finding that, 79% of those studies reported that religious people were, in fact, happier, while only 1% reported that they were less happy and the rest found no or mixed feelings. So I, I... I think that is, it seems right to me, but um, maybe that's surprising to some, I'm not sure. So I want to consult with Dr. Relich, uh, excuse me, Dr. Lee Richardson, forgive me. And Dr. Lee, when you hear this, um, this study, what are your thoughts? Well, the research is there. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, I always say the answer's in the data. But the research, the research shows that one in three people that attend uh, services on a regular basis are very happy. And I think there's different reasons. I don't think that's the only thing that makes them happy. But I always look at cause and effect. And that's just because coming at everything from the brain standpoint, I tend to do that. So, you know, what's causing the happiness? And I think that what it is, is that the people that have their, that have their connection. And whether it's God or Buddha or Allah, the, the higher being, whatever it is, if you have that strong connection and you're able to believe, and with belief comes, you know, a lot of people have hope. Oh, I hope things are going to get better. I hope this will change. But when you believe and you have faith, then it, you have that inner peace that does give you that happiness because you actually do believe things are going to get better, things are going to change. So I think that's, that's a big factor. And I think the other thing is, too, is, you know, we're all social, social creatures and we like to be together and religious services do provide a, a, a venue for that to happen. Yeah, uh, social context, you're saying. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Lee, um, when people go to their Thanksgiving, well, not Thanksgiving, excuse me, their Easter uh, celebrations this weekend, and they're going to deal with family members like they do on Thanksgiving that sometimes are unruly or, you know, have that second glass of wine and become difficult to be around, uh, what's your advice to those that are listening on dealing with family members. I'm going to ask you to hold off on giving that advice so we can take a quick pause and come back. But when we come back, I'd love for you to answer that question. Folks, we're on with Dr. Lee Richardson. Uh, she's with us. Check out her website, leerichardson.com. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-4. 5337 833 for Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. Call now. 
now. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. So smartphones are to blame for spikes in depression and anxiety amongst teenagers. And religiosity is uh, correlated to well-being and happiness. Dr. Lee Richardson, those are just two things we've discussed. But tell everybody that's listening, you know, you uh, have an active practice and actually help people. What's the number one thing that you're dealing with when people come to see you? What's the the prominent, uh, I'm going to call it a complaint for lack of a better word. Well, I see a lot of people with anxiety and depression, and I work with that neurodivergent population, the ADHD and the autism. Well, that's me. I'm an ADHD. And, and you know what? One out of four of us is. There is no neurotypical. We're all, in our own way, neurodivergent. But I think the biggest problem for people is is lack of adaptability. That and and in my in the brain world, that's mental flexibility. We get stuck. And, you know, that old my way or the highway, that road's closed and and that road's been closed. And we have to get over that. And and we've got to learn to be more adaptable and even more agile and to, you know, to collaborate. And that's something that I see young people, old people, people of all ages have a hard time with. Yeah. Now, if people want to learn more about the work that you're doing, how do they find you? Do they just go to LeeRichardson.com? Where do you uh, instruct everybody to go? Well, I'm all over the place. I've got the Brain Performance Center. I've got the Brain Performance Institute, which is where the, the work that I do with organizations is. Then there's Lee Richardson and always on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram. And I encourage people, you know, if you really have questions, reach out. I am happy to to provide information and answer questions. Now, if people want to get in touch with you on Facebook or Instagram, uh, where do they find you? What's the handle? The Brain Performance Center. At the Brain Performance Center, and they find you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Lee Richardson. Perfect. Yes. Well, Dr. Lee Richardson, as always, it's, uh, it's always an honor and a pleasure to have a conversation with you. And I thank you for staying up late with us. Um, I know it's not easy for everybody to stay up late uh, for this program. You are a gentlewoman, a scholar, and a patriot, and I really appreciate it. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, and thank you for having me. My pleasure. Hope to talk to you again soon. And, folks, we will continue our conversation with you all on Open Phone America. Now, Open Phone America, a time-honored tradition here on this program, and I always look forward to it. And Fridays are always very robust because, you know, I guess people are like, hey, man, there's no work tomorrow. I'm staying up late. We're going to get into it. And I think we have some of the best conversations on Friday evenings. So I I, I always look forward to that. And if you missed any of the interviews we've done this week, definitely go and check out the website, richvaldez.com. You can download any one of our shows there. You can also click on the link right to the podcast, you know, whether you're on Spotify or Apple or Google or whatever platform you're on, you can subscribe to those podcasts and get notifications when there's brand new episodes, which every day, uh, probably about an hour after the show ends live, you can get the actual podcast of it. But if you want to listen to an old show or you you say, man, that, that Lee Richardson, she was great on Good Friday. I want to go back. You can always go back and stream it right from the website, richvaldezamericatnight.com. And I know we got some listeners in Sacramento that are looking uh, for how to listen to the show. That's how you do it. Go to richvaldez.com. All right, folks, the music means they're kicking me out. I'm coming right back. Open Phone America. Don't go anywhere. city that never sleeps 17 miles from madison square garden new york city it's america at night with rich valdez america's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across america and now here is your host rich valdez
Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the Friday night edition of the program. It's Good Friday. Happy Easter to everybody. Our telephone number, if you want to join the show, 833-482-5337, 833-4VALDEZ. And Joe Biden uh, is an absolute disgrace. Um, we'll get into him in a second. Uh, Joe Lieberman, the senator, was laid to rest. And uh, God God bless him, right? God rest his soul. I didn't agree with him on everything, but he wasn't a bad guy, in my opinion. Uh, and then we've got, let's see. Oh, they finally got him. ICE has nabbed the migrant influencer who went viral for taunting America. This is a bald Venezuelan guy, or a really short-haired Venezuelan guy, who was out there saying, yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, his name is uh, Lionel Moreno. And he was um, doing all of these uh, Instagram live videos and, and TikToks about, about uh, yeah, just keep coming from Venezuela. The border's wide open. They'll give you money when you get here. I had a kid when I got here. They're taking care of my kid. They're giving me money. And guess what? If somebody's not living in their home, you could take their home because they have squatters' rights and all that stuff. And uh, if you uh, want to hear the, the audio of this guy and hear the translation of it, check out uh, my last This Is America podcast. That one, uh, we break it down right in the beginning, right in the first segment, before we talk about the dangers of the Tren de Aragua that we talked about on this program and uh, we uh, echoed on the podcast. If you want to hear that conversation, definitely check out This Is America with Rich Valdez. And uh, that's uh, wherever podcasts are found. But very, very interesting. Anyway, they've got this guy. And uh, good, I'm glad they got him. He's uh, My dad would say he's a pendejo, this guy. He really is. And I saw a video of him, uh, you know, the way he started yelling, screaming very defiantly. Uh, and then the most recent video, he's in tears. He's in, de- in tears and his, um, his, his um, hair looks like he dyed it blue. And he's, uh, he's been arrested, apparently. Uh, he is a migrant influencer. His name is Lionel Moreno. He uh, mocked America on social media in several viral videos, and he's been nabbed by the federal immigration authorities. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE, AOC wanted to destroy them and uh, defund them. Uh, Their fugitive operations officers arrested him in Columbus, Ohio today. He's currently being held at the county jail there, according to ICE's um, records. And the arrest comes after the New York Post exclusively reported how he had skipped out on on ICE soon after crossing the southern border into Texas back in 2022 and was now wanted by the authorities. And this guy was there flashing stacks of cash, holding his infant child on these videos, really just making a mockery of the system. And I guess the Biden folks got embarrassed at, you know, what they're actually doing. This guy, they're doing it secretly and they're trying to, you know, they're like, we we use all sorts of political rhetoric to hide this. But this guy comes and puts it all on display. So in a statement to The New York Post, um, ICE spokesman said that Lionel Moreno is an unlawful, unlawfully present citizen of Venezuela who illegally entered the country on April 23rd, 2022. And Moreno was placed in the alternatives to detention program by Border Patrol and was told to report to enforcement and removal operations within 60 days. And guess what? He didn't do it. Now, Moreno did not report as required on March 29th of 2024. So he was arrested in Ohio by officers with ERO, uh, Detroit's Columbus uh, um, office, and they're currently detained with uh, pending further immigration proceedings. Now, while he was in the U.S., uh, Mr. Moreno used his various social media channels to encourage other migrants to invade the country and to squat the homes of American citizens. I remember seeing that and I thought, this guy's out of his mind. ICE probably saved his life. I'm sure there's a lot of people that said, yep, try that around here, brother. And uh, like the song says, try that in a small town. And all while waving around his wads of cash and flaunting what he said were government handouts. So in uh, in one video, and I might have talked about this one in the podcast, you could see him holding a Social Security card, and he was uh, frequently boasting about his earnings um, because he was begging for cash. Right. He just begged for money. He said, there's money everywhere around here. And uh, in one of them, he says, I didn't cross the Rio Grande to come here and work like a slave in one Instagram clip. He says, I came to the U.S. to mark my territory. You're hurt because I make more than you without much more work while you're working like a slave. You understand what I'm saying? 
That's what he said in another social media video. And then he says, that's the difference between you and me. I'm always going to make lots of money without much work. And you're always going to be exploited and miserable and insignificant. Well, Mr. Moreno, I think it's come to an end. And he was crying in that last video. TikTok recently shut down his account. Oh, look at the social media censorship. The White House probably called TikTok and said, hey, shut this guy down. He's embarrassing us. He's telling everybody, you know, the quiet part out loud. He had roughly 500,000 followers. His Instagram, which was still active as of Friday, has 17,000 followers. And his ban from TikTok, um, he says, yes, they closed my account, but I keep earning on Facebook and Instagram. I won't earn the same, but I'm going to get my TikTok account back. I'm going to keep earning money. That's what he said. Uh, that's a quote from him. When he was released uh, into the United States after crossing the border illegally, Mr. Moreno was enrolled in the Alternatives to Detention program, which, again, is nothing short of amnesty, where he was uh, monitored by a tracking device. Yeah, sure he was. Uh, but soon after his release, Mr. Moreno stopped complying and failed to show up for a check-in with authorities. And uh, obviously, you lose your little tracking device and then you never come back. Look, he's here modeling uh, his favorite AR-15. I mean, this guy's just a legit clown. Absolutely a clown. Anyway, uh, ICE records reviewed by the New York Post showed that immigration officials were aware that Mr. Moreno has been on national news for being in uh, various TikTok videos about uh, in his encouragement of more illegal immigration. And they didn't immediately respond to a request for comment, but they did issue that statement I read earlier. And... The uh, obviously the diplomatic ties between the United States and Venezuela are currently strained, to say the least. And it wasn't immediately clear if Mr. Marino would be a candidate for deportation or he would be held in ICE custody. Uh, I don't know either, but I can tell you this. If this guy gets out and he goes back to making videos, it's only going to get worse. So I'm pretty sure they're going to figure out where to put this guy. That's just my thought. But that's the story on illegal immigration. And plus, we've talked a lot about Good Friday uh, Easter that is coming up this weekend and brain health, which was an interesting topic. Anyway, I, I want to get to you some of your calls. Uh, let's see, where do we go from here? We've got calls from all over the place. Let me see who's been on the longest. Uh, Diane in Chicago, WGN, great station. Diane, go right ahead. Okay, thank you, Rich. Um, I'm in listening to what you're saying about this guy. Good that is crying. You know, I'm I'm one of these people who have called it an invasion and all of that. And there's right. the, the there's now I think carjackings, there's robberies, and there I've seen the pictures of certain people robbery in the red line, and they have and they do look Hispanic and they look young. So they're they're spreading the word in some of them. But on the other side of the coin, there was an on on the radio today. There was an interview. Um, this reporter was talking about this Venezuelan who is was, he was speaking in Spanish. He was um, being interpreted, by, and he was explaining how he's being evicted by April third. See, the mayor now, in his hypocrisy, has now decreed that there will be an arbitrary date by which they will be evicted from shelters. But this guy was lamenting the fact that other people have other means and they're they're um, not uh, having to be the, the arbitrary date. It shouldn't be an arbitrary date for everybody. He was trying to say that there's certain people according to need that they shouldn't be. It shouldn't be everybody, in other words. So right, there, yeah. but that goes to from a Christian as a Christian, the individual, instead of a mob, you don't come to America and do a, uh, and sit like a mob. And, and take over and have no manners and no respect for law or or nothing. You know what I mean? But the but the end. But every but everything's individual. Anybody who got lib, the gift of liberty is stepping one step at a time, seeing what tomorrow will bring, having faith in that way, and having the the only liberty you have is to 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 be free from tyranny, and you have that liberty to seek your happiness. The right to pursue happiness. That's what the, but you can only do it as individual, as an individual. And that's why that story, it's a sad thing then when you get this certain individuals who are trying maybe now that they're stuck or they're here or whatever. Okay. As long as they're here, then they're trying to have some kind of life and, 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 and that, you know what I mean? Totally. I, I get what you're saying. Listen, everybody wants to be charitable. Everybody wants to be nice. This is the result of being charitable and nice, right? When you allow a million people a year into your country, 
Um, super. You want to be charitable and benevolent? Great. Uh, but with that comes problems like these, where you have this this problem that's gone out of control, and it, it went beyond being a problem. The problem is Joe Biden, right? The problem is his policies. The problem is that he's allowing the border to, to remain open and thinks that he's doing somebody a favor by letting everybody in. Obviously, he's not. And and that's that is the problem. He is the problem. So I get what you're saying. Everybody wants to be nice, but you can't. Uh, this is perfect example, right? Um, I mean, I can't think of another clear cut example. Yeah, of course, uh, the murder of Lincoln Riley and 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 others. Uh, uh, Miss Garcia. I mean, this is just a a a bad situation. It it's not about immigration. It's about crime. And if you're allowing criminals from other countries to come here, then you're doing it wrong. It's that simple. And I feel like people are missing the message there. Anyway, uh, Diane, I thank you for your uh, astute comments and thank you for your call. I really appreciate it. Big shout out to everybody listening in Chicago on WGN. And we're going to continue with the rest of your calls and more straight ahead. We've got calls from Wisconsin, from Georgia, from Maine, from Ohio, and from the Philippines. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. For Valdez. That's 833-482-5337. 4 Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, welcome back. And yesterday there was the fundraiser in New York City. Uh, Donald Trump went to uh, the wake of uh, Officer Dillon, who is a Diller, excuse me, the um, fallen police officer murdered in the line of duty. And uh, President Obama, President Clinton, and President Biden all hung out with Lizzo and a bunch of other entertainers and had a fundraiser. And again, there's nothing wrong with having a fundraiser per se. I think there's just something wrong when you have this big funeral of, of a cop and you've got another former president going there. I think at some point you got to just, even if you don't go, you, you say, hey, look, you know, we want to give, let the family have an opportunity to grieve, but uh, our heart goes out to them and, we, you know, and say it publicly because now you've got somebody shunning you and making you look insignificant. And that's Trump that's doing that. So whether whether he was right or wrong for doing it, I think you have to you have to defend yourself and you have to do the right thing and show the family that you care. And I, I don't think that uh, the team Biden did that. So they had their attack dogs and their friends, I should say their lap dogs, uh, in the media on CNN and MSNBC jump in for them, right? They're standing right in the gap for their friends. Uh, you got the former... Um, South Carolina Representative Bakari Sellers on CNN today, and he's saying, look, uh, this fundraiser for Biden, what you saw was the party unified. That's why you had all these presidents together, right? Uh, it wasn't unlike the fractured GOP where Trump had to go to that wake all by himself. Ha ha ha. Listen to this. Yeah, there's no way to, to put a, a damper on what uh, the president was able to accomplish yesterday. What you saw was a party unified. I mean, I, you had Bill Clinton, you had Joe Biden and you had Barack Obama all together raising money for a unified effort to defeat Donald Trump. Uh, I don't think you can pay George W. Bush any any amount of money to stand next to uh, Donald Trump. You have a fractured party. You have Nikki Haley, who garnered a third to 40 percent of uh, the Republican voters as she was running uh, her failed bid in the primary election. And so you have a unified party versus a fractured party. And even more importantly, one of the things that you pointed to was twenty six million dollars is I guess the, the older folks say is nothing to shake a stick at, right? Mm -hmm. So $26 million is a lot. We are out raising Republicans and all the money that Donald Trump is raising selling Bibles is probably going to his legal defense fund. So now again, I've been around this stuff, I guess, long enough to realize a fractured a Republican party, I think is the strength of the Republican party. Just because they decide to use the word fractured, you know, and, and I always hear callers say, you know, the Democrats, the one thing they get right. No, I don't think that's the one thing they get right. I don't think the one thing that they get right is that they all agree in lockstep. 
uh, authoritarianism or, or a dictatorial style that we all do as we're told. And, you know, like the, the jackboot goose uh, stomp that we've seen in, in so many other countries. Uh, I've uh, What I've always liked about the Republican Party is that you have such nuance. There is such a, a, a breadth with the uh, of diversity within the party. And I don't mean ethnic diversity. I mean of ideas, right? Whether you have the, the tax and spend uh, liberal uh, appropriations type of Republicans uh, or the let's get rid of the Department of Education uh, fiscal conservatives. I think they all work together. And I think that that's what makes it what they've always called the big tent party. Nobody's ever said the Democrats are the big tent party. They were I, always all in for the unions. They were always all, all in for whatever got them political power. And it was always very clear. Uh, Republicans, I think, had different things going on. Right? They may, some of them may have gotten political power from the abortion lobby, but I think for the most part, most of them didn't. It was the only power they had was that there was a litmus. People would say, I, I might vote for you if I know your position on, on the life issue. And people had to decide because they had to deal with constituents. They had to deal with voters. So I think that's a thing. And I think it's a strength. But for Bakari Sellers to say that we're a fractured party or that Democrats are out raising Republicans, of course they do. What, since when have they not? Since when have you ever heard of Republicans raising more money than Democrats? It's not something I've ever seen. I mean, maybe Trump's done it once or twice, but it's not the norm. That's always been the case. Democrats have always had Hollywood. They can always call David Geffen, Steven Spielberg, whoever they want, Puff Daddy, Diddy Combs, right? And uh, say, hey, look, we need to do a fundraiser. Can we use your house in the Hamptons? Can we use your house in the Hollywood Hills? Can we use your house in wherever? And get it done. Malibu, on the beach, you know, whatever it is they got to do. I mean, this is how the business works. Oh, okay, some Republicans have a little bit of clout to do something like that on the East Coast, but by and large, they don't. They don't, they're not part of these, these massive um, networks of people. So uh, that, those kinds of people. But what I mean by that is the um, entertainment uh, folks. So uh, I think that Bakari Sellers is wrong here. And I think that a fractured Republican Party means that there's nuance in ideas. Not everybody being brainwashed the same way. Anyway, I, I talked way too much in that segment. I wanted to go to your calls. And uh, I guess we'll start off with this call. And if we run out of time, we're going to come right back to it. But let's go to Paul in Zanesville, W-H-I-Z. Paul, go right ahead. Hey, good evening, Rich. Yeah, you know, um, I, it just peeves me really bad that um, Joe Biden didn't go, you know, to the, the, the uh, wake there for the um, – uh, police officer. And yeah, Paul, I don't want to cut you off and I don't want the music to trample you. So we're going to come right back to you being pissed off about Joe Biden not going to the wake of the New York City police officer murdered in the line of duty, Officer Diller. Paul in Zanesville, don't worry about it. We're coming right back to you. Folks, if you want to join the conversation, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. What a collection of uh, political talent on that stage last night. Uh, uh, you know, if, if you've got uh, Barack Obama and you've got Bill Clinton, they know a bit about um, uh, being president and they talked a lot about that. But they also know a whole lot about running for president and about uh, speaking to this country uh, in a way that represents uh, Democratic Party views, uh, progressive views uh, to, to varying degrees, um, while not sort of turning others off um, uh, necessarily. Um, uh, and it triggers 
obviously Obama triggers some people. He triggers Donald Trump massively. But uh, but 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 wow, what an what an what a night, what an event. And twenty six million dollars is just a staggering amount of money to have raised in one evening. It's just uh, it just boggles yeah. the mind. Uh, it gives a sense of the Biden campaign as something of a of a juggernaut uh, while Donald Trump worries about his court cases and and uh, cheats to win his his own golf tournament. Well, there you have uh, Eugene Robinson. He's uh, wowed by the collection of political talent. And I've got to say, um, yeah, so uh, first of all, Obama triggers some people. Yeah, me. Uh, it's not just Trump that he triggers. I think there's a lot of people that are, are triggered by Obama. And uh, most people who are old enough to remember what life was like before Obama ran for president, um, things were actually a lot better. I mean, it wasn't a perfect world, right? We did have the, the big Iraq war and all sorts of spending. Yeah, that was there. But uh, we didn't have all of this diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff that's ruining people, right? All sorts of people. It's not helping any black people. It's not helping any white people. It's just hurting people all around. We didn't have all the, the, the craziness with Iran, the appeasement of Iran. So much has happened. So much has changed. Uh, but anyway, Eugene Robinson, look, I mean, we have differing views here, right? Um, he, he says uh, in a way that doesn't... Um, alienate certain people. Yeah, it alienates everybody who doesn't like these progressive views. And it's funny how they speak in this, this, these platitudes where it's almost as if, if you are not on board with them, then you somehow don't count, right? Uh, Because everybody should be on board with an agenda like this. I disagree. I disagree. And uh, shame on me if that's a bad thing. But we we were talking about how the, the media is praising uh, Biden and Obama and Clinton for being a collection of political talent. Oh, boy. Right. While downplaying the fact that Donald Trump was there doing what what any elected official, what the mayor should have done with uh, what anybody, you know, with any uh, brains and, and respect and, and interaction uh, with the community would have done and showed up and said, hey, my condolences to you and your family. I, you know, they're bragging about twenty six million dollars. But who was it that, you know, um, announced the um, the payment after the call from Trump to the family saying, hey, look, we're sorry, but we're going to help you how we can. And after that phone call, right after they get a call from the Tunnels of Towers Foundation saying, hey, look, we're going to pay off your mortgage. Right. And that, that wasn't there was no press conference. There was no media coverage of that, but it happened. And now you look at Eugene Robinson from um the Washington post. He's on the morning Joe on MSNBC and he's gushing over this Biden fundraiser uh, saying how much money they raised and not a single penny of it. uh, Did any of them announce was going to this family who left behind this little cute little baby. If you've seen the photos, right of the officer who lost his life, who was murdered. Unbelievable. Anyway, we left off with our buddy in Zanesville, Ohio, Paul on W H I Z Paul go right ahead. Well, you know what I have to say about that guy was just on, <clears throat> you know, that's what I got to say about that guy because, you know, the, it's just ridiculous. But um, here's what denotes a true president from a politician. Okay. Donald Trump goes to that uh, the gentleman's wake. He was shot in the line of duty, you know, doing a very heroic thing, being a police officer in the United States of America. Okay. Now, I realize he's raising – $26 million or whatever. But Joe Biden, you have to stand for America. And I always deviate, but I have to when I call you because you, you go through so many you know, mm-hmm. things that I have to listen to. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's so interesting. I love your show. Thank and you. um, uh, yes. And now can I say one more thing about um, um, uh, Easter? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I have uh, come closer to God lately. Um, you know, the, the, there may be some reasons. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I just think that uh, your pastor that you had on, they were great. And um, uh, all I can say is that if we don't wake up and see that Joe Biden is not the way this country should go, you know, Donald Trump is. I mean, this man is compassionate. You know, um, he's been through so much and look how strong he stayed. Joe Biden can't hardly stand up on his two feet. You know, that's probably why he had Obama and Clinton beside him. You know, and I was a Democrat, uh, Rich, for a long, long time. (laughs) Yeah, one to hold up each side of his arm, right? 
Right, right, exactly. So I don't know if Joe Biden's run this country, but um, I think it's Barack Obama. But um, I just uh, if you, if you can't see the differences there between a man that stands for America and a man that can't stand America, well, then I don't know what to tell you. Rich, you have a very happy Easter, and I'd like a response. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Happy Easter to you, too. And, Paul, I, I, what else can I say? I think you're right. Uh, to me, it's clear. And something I've learned to reconcile in life is sometimes everybody sees things different, right? Uh, while Eugene Johnson, uh, maybe he really believes that. Maybe that's part of his job. Uh, that he's supposed to say those things to try and normalize things, or maybe he truly believes that stuff. But either way, I think he's off his rocker. I disagree. I'll never agree. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't want to hang out with the guy. It doesn't mean I don't want to talk to the guy. He's welcome to come on this show. If I see him in the bar, uh, I will happily buy him a beer to, to sit here and pick his brain a little bit, honestly, to figure out why do you believe? Do you really believe uh, these things that you know, somehow as a professional journalist on television, you need to say Trump is cheating on his taxes. Um, Maybe I would mention that if if, if I were um, in his shoes, but I, I just don't think I think there's bigger things, right? You're talking about a guy he's saying he's going to spend it on his legal defense. Then if you really believe he's guilty, why not talk about that? Why not say, you know, he's got 91 counts. The guy's a career criminal. Donald Trump, he's got more charges than Al Capone. How could you trust a guy like that? But they're not doing that, right? He's going to saying he's cheating on his golf game. I mean, really, w w what are you trying to say? Do you think people... Uh, across America are going to be like, oh, my God, he cheats on his golf game. And I'm not saying he did. I'm just saying just imagine. So I, I think you're right, Paul. Um, this is a, uh, a classic example of just people seeing things differently. And um, all I can do is keep talking until other people tend to see it, um, you know, a little bit clearer than, than they might be seeing it because right now we're not in the best uh, position. Anyway, uh, Paul, thank you very much. Happy Easter. We continue. I want to go to Mike. Harpswell, Maine, WLOB. Mike, go right ahead. You know, Rich, if you sat down with Eugene Robinson to have a beer, hmm. to pick his brain, there wouldn't be a hell of a lot of picking going on. <laughs> is, is he but he sounds person? really good when he's saying what he's saying. He's got a great voice. Oh, yeah. Is he the new spokesman for the party that was against big money and politics? Yeah, yeah. Right. Who remembers those days? Yeah. Hey, listen, the reason I called you was I caught that little bit earlier. They had caught the illegal alien. Yes. They would, uh, had the website and all that. Uh, look, you know what the real takeaway from this mm -hmm. is the squatter, the squatter laws in yeah. the United States. We better pay attention to this real quick. Yeah. Cause a lot of our states have squatters' rights laws that most of the citizens weren't even aware of. And uh, you're right. You get these people in. You get these people in there squatting. In some states, you can't get them out. It'll take you months in court to get them out. You're right. I saw a video and, you know, from New York State recently, and uh, the the woman. It was a woman uh, uh, landlord, and she was trying to get rid of squatters, and they they arrested her because she like tried to physically remove them from her home and, and the cops came and arrested her. And I thought, man, we're in bad shape. If you can't throw somebody out of your house, property you own, cause they're, they had no deal with you and they're just living there cause they say they live there. Uh, whatever happened to private property rights, right? These squatter rights laws that you're talking about, I think they're, um, you know, blanketly, I'm going to say they, they sound like they're antithetical to the constitution and we definitely need to look into that for sure. Mike. I think every state, whatever state you're living in, look up your squatter right laws because I'll tell you, this is really going to get serious before it gets over. You got another caravan on the way to the border. I know, another, what, 2,000 people? It's absolutely a disgrace. Mike, I want to wish you a happy uh, Easter, and thank you for giving us a call this Good Friday. I got to uh, stop right here and come right back. Folks, we're going to come right back with the rest of your calls, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S.
I want to listen to you, Rich, all the time. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, welcome back. 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And let's see, we've got uh, calls from Montana, Ohio, Oregon, West Coast in the building, and the Philippines. Let's start off with Gil. Uh, Gil, welcome back, sir. Happy Easter. Feliz Pascua, mi gran amigo. Thank you, brother. Uh, I wanted to talk about the uh, the, the key bridge. Uh, it seems now that uh, instead of uh, airplanes flying into tall buildings, <laughs> now they have ships that uh, terrorists can use as a weapon. Right. And uh, let me... Who may not know, know this story? Have you ever heard of Ramsey al Uh The Blind Sheik? No, well, he worked with the Blind Sheik. But uh, he worked he, with the uh, Blind Sheik, right? These are the he, guys from Jersey City, 1993 World Trade Center? Yeah, he he, he uh, made the bomb when they tried to... Uh, uh, right, yeah, yeah. First well, time they we, tried to take out the World Trade Center. Uh, mm-hmm. He's uh, in uh, the... Uh, uh, the, the the big uh, lockdown place in the U.S. He'll never get out. He was extradited to the U.S. from Pakistan with the agreement that he would not be given the death penalty. So he's locked up for good. But because of him, uh, you can't bring Winkwoods on an airplane. He blew up uh, a bomb. Uh, on a, uh, a Philippine Airlines 747. It wow. didn't take it down. They were able to make an emergency landing. But he smuggled it, 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 in the guise of uh, contact lens solution uh, mm. the, uh, the bomb that went off. Also, he's the reason you got to take your shoes off when you go to airport security. He's oh, I thought that was Richard who, Reed, the shoe bomber, who had put, like, plastic explosive in the sole of his shoe. These guys are nuts, Gil. Yeah, I understand. But Ramsey Youssef designed the shoe bomb because he knew that ah. it, it, you could get it through. Yeah, he designed all that stuff. One guy. And one last thing. Uh, the intelligence people here warned the United States that they had found in his safe house some plans about hijacking airplanes and flying them into buildings. And the, our intelligence people in the U.S. poo-pooed that like it. So you just never know. Right. You never know if they're going to take a ship and uh, bang it into a bridge. No, I think you're right, Gil. It can happen. And I think we shouldn't discount it only because we've seen what can happen with the, the level of crazy when people want to hurt people in this country. Gil in Manila, Philippines. Feliz Pascua. Happy Thanksgiving to you, my brother. Thank you so much for the call. And um, let us go to Kara, Eugene, Oregon, KGAO. Go right ahead. KGAL, hi there. Oh, KGAL, well, uh, excuse me. How are you? Oh, that's okay. I'm fine, thanks. I, I, I bet Montana and the other one were there before me, so I'm sorry. But, but, but anyway, here's the thing about these squatters. I've got a funny little take on it. And, of course, you'd have to make sure that they weren't going to do something to you. You'd have It'd depend on the kind of squatters you had. But I think I'd yank on up one fine day in, a, in about a three-quarter size uh, moving truck full of stuff with about four great big giant, perhaps, hairy guys, hmm. tough guys. And I'd, and I'd probably bring a locksmith with me if they changed locks on me. And I'd go up there and I'd knock on the door. Maybe I'd even have a little police escort, too. Who knows? Maybe not. And I'd knock on the door and, I, honey, I'm home. And they say, <laughs> hey, you can't come in here. We're living here. I said, oh, no, no, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm not putting you out. I'm moving in with you. Wow. In fact, you're kind of... <laughs> You're kind of handsome. Maybe uh, maybe you'd like to get married. I'm only 72. Kara, <laughs> uh, <Cara>, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just move right on with them. Move right on in with them, you know. 
I love it. Well, uh, I don't know. I, I haven't had to deal with squatters, and I hope I never have to. And uh, I doubt that I'm going to tell them I'm going to marry them. But I could see the humor in the story, and uh, I love the flip side of things. Kara, thank you for your call. Have a great uh, Good Friday and even better Easter. And, folks, we're going to pause right here. We're coming right back for the speed round. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. late night radio six years in a row it's rich valdez scott in franklin ohio wday what are your thoughts on this migrant influencer who was uh showing off about how much cash he could make and squat in people's property yeah he'll be squatting all right when he goes to prison i hope he squats really well and i'll tell you uh, one more thing if you don't mind i want to say oh, biden obama and Clinton, they sound like a real good three of being at a, at a comedy club. And people like that, there's a phrase I always go and say, idiots doing idiot things because they're idiots. Yeah, you're right. Stupid uh, stupid is like stupid does. That's absolutely true. Scott in Franklin, Ohio, WDAY, thank you for the call, brother. Happy Easter to you. Let us continue. Let us go to Al, Kalispell, Montana, KOFI. Go right ahead quickly. Hey, Rich. Um, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Trump going to the officer's wake. Trump cares about the family and America. The commiecrats only care about power. Man, you said it so well, Al. I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, I think most people saw that. I don't think anybody said, yeah, you know what? You're right. Trump was an idiot for going to that thing. And those guys, good good job on them for raising money and not going to, to the cop that was murdered. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't think anybody's saying that except for Eugene Robinson on MSNBC. Al, great point. Happy Easter to you, my friend. Frank Evergreen, Montana, KOFI, go right ahead. What's up with this shipping cargo business? So that company, Grace, private uh, shipping, limited. Yes. They're worldwide. They used to be WR Grace. Now they're just called Grace. And if you go to their website, check their products that they, they haul. And, and their uh, worldwide headquarters is right in in Maryland, in hmm. Columbia, Maryland, and they're connected with the uh, Balt, uh, see, uh, an insurance company over there, Maryland Casualty. But and what what type of um, what send, type of haul do they have? You can't, send diamond, you can't send any divers down there. It's too toxic of water or forever hmm. chemicals. You have. What did you find out robots. about what they were hauling? Just go to their website. It, it's just the worst of the worst. You would imagine what they, they all on those ships. Hopefully it wasn't like small children being trafficked for sex because uh, there was a lot of rumors about that, which I hope are unfounded and unsubstantiated and untrue. Frank in Evergreen, Montana, KOFI, big shout out to you. Thanks for the call. I appreciate it. America, thanks for a great week on the radio. I love each and every one of you. It's great to chat with you. Happy Easter. Happy Good Friday. Enjoy the weekend. We celebrate the resurrection. And thank God, right, somebody died for all of our sins. Anyway, hasta la próxima. Until the next time, America, take care, good night, and God bless. I'm Rich Valdez.